record. There we go. Great. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Royer, and I'm head of community services at the Lucy Robbins Wells Library. And I am here with uh, Jennifer Hebert, the head of our reference department. And we also have Area Libraries Berlin, and we have Rocky Hill with us tonight. And so we wanna welcome everyone from our surrounding towns. We're so happy to be able to offer all of this collaborative programs. So tonight we are having our program called The Queen Requests Your Presence. And it's an armchair travel through England. And many of our favorite books and places to go, we're gonna hear about, we're gonna get some behind the scenes, find out our travel agents' favorite things about England. And without any further ado, I am going to introduce uh, Trisha and Valerie and just want you to know that they're from French's Worldwide Travel where they have over 80 years experience. Mm -hmm. And they're also members of the Newington Chamber of Commerce. So take it away, Trisha. I can't wait to learn of more course. about England. Yes, of course we're members of the chamber. Why wouldn't we be? We would live here so to speak. So yes, my name is Trish. I work here at French's Travel. My boss, Valerie, is also here with us as well. And we are really super excited to, to talk about this destination. It's one of our favorites. Um, we've both been there multiple times and it's it really is a magical destination in so many different ways. And hopefully you'll feel the same after this presentation is done. Um, one of the things that I've always loved about Great Britain is that we share the same language or do we? So they have different terms for commonplace things. An elevator is a lift, a car hood is a bonnet, a truck is a lorry. Those are adorable, I must say. And they also have colorful expressions, kerfuffle, which is a disagreement. I've used that on occasion. Then also has that term bloody, which I'm sure most of you have heard in certain movies, and that's for emphasis. And then my favorite is a term called gobsmacked, which the gob is uh, a term for the mouth in England. So when you're gobsmacked, you're shocked. The Scots also have a few of their own. One interesting one is, is if you say something is scabby, it's not a wound, it's just dirty. If, if they say, if unfortunately, if they tell you that you're naff, it means you're boring. So hopefully no one ever says that to you. And I know Valerie certainly has some favorites of her own. Valerie, you want to share those? Sure. Um, I like the ones that are a little bit funny and might get you into some trouble. So if you hear somebody refer to a rubber, it's an eraser, not a common a condom. Very important distinction. They just call them a condom. We use the word pants to refer to our trousers or our slacks. But you may, if you make a reference to your pants, you might get some strange looks because over there, it means your underpants. And if somebody says they're pissed, they aren't mad at you, they're drunk. So there's also some helpful food translations. Some we probably know by now, but a cookie is called a biscuit. Fries are chips, but chips are crisps. And we probably all know that fish and chips is really with our French fries, not with potato chips, but that's how we all know that chips. Shrimp is called prawns. And for some reason, they call some of their vegetables by the French words. They call an eggplant the French aubergine and a zucchini squash is a courgette. They use the French, we use the Italian. There's some important words you would use when traveling. Um, they call the bathroom the loo, or you may see WC written on the door, short for water closet. The ATM is a cash point. The pharmacy is the chemist. And they call your reservation your booking instead of a reservation. And that's, that's it. Got back to you, Trish. <laughs> Thanks, Valerie. Um, one side note on the crisps. They have some really bizarre flavors. Um, they do have one called prong cocktail, which is actually pretty darn wonderful. So give them a try when you go there. So here's a map 
of England. You know, we also have Ireland in there, but we'll pretend they're not there right now. Um, I just wanted to highlight the two flags. So England has the Union flag, and it's called the Union flag unless you're at sea. If you're at sea, then it's the Union Jack. Okay. Okay. Scotland has their St. Andrew's Cross. They also have another one that's called the Lion Rampart. And that's the one that some of you might remember has a red background with a, a lion on it. And that is the one that you often hear, often see people at, at sporting events waving that flag around because, you know, it's got a lion on it. So why wouldn't they? So, you know, so there's two flags, but that's the main one. And you'll probably see a lot of flags flying because there's a big event this year that Valerie, I think we need to talk about. So on February 6th of this year, Queen Elizabeth II became the first British monarch to celebrate a platinum jubilee or 70 years of service on the throne. At 95, she's also the oldest monarch in the world and currently the longest reigning monarch in the world. Britain has been celebrating all year, but the big celebration is over the four day bank holiday weekend, June 2nd to the 5th. There will be parades, a horse racing derby, lighting of beacons, which are just torches, all around the country and even around the world throughout the Commonwealth. And on Sunday, they will have the big lunch where neighborhoods get together in the spirit of fun and friendship, somewhat of a street party, block party all over. And we were thinking that maybe we should plan our own big lunch on June 5th. What do you think? Um, the Platinum Jubilee pageant and concert on June 4th from Buckingham Palace should be amazing. We should, it will all be broadcast on BBC, so set your DVRs. I know I'll be watching to see how the, to see how the other half lives. Okay, now we wouldn't be doing a presentation on England and Britain if we didn't talk about the capital city of London. So when a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. For there is in London all that life can afford. Samuel Johnson. Very true. I mean, London is a city of extremes. Of everything is there that you could possibly want to do. So. London back in the 50s was referred to as the big smoke because during the 50s they did experience a lethal smog that covered the city for five days in 1952 and it basically shut the city down but luckily that doesn't happen anymore unless it's fog and then it's just called London fog see London officially became swinging like our friend Austin Powers here um, in the 60s and it became the sort of a focal point of the fashion and culture of the time um some of us who are in the crowd may or may not know this name, Mary Quant, but she invented something that you will know no matter what your age pretty much, and that's the mini skirt. So we can thank her for that. Um, that was also the time when the Mini Cooper hit the streets. So that's a wonderful little sporty car, absolutely minuscule when it first came out. Some of those a bit older may also recognize the names of Twiggy and Jean Shrimpton, both were models, and, and I think some act, they did some acting as well. And the 60s also gave us uh, Bond, James Bond, and some group called the Beatles. I don't really know who they are, but maybe, I'll, maybe someone could share with me who they are. So, oops, sorry. Okay, London has, like I said, has a lot to see and do. And one of the places I've been to twice in my visits to London is this, the London Zoo. It's a really wonderfully well-designed zoo. It's really got a great mix of animals. It's really well-designed and it's just really a super fun experience. So one of the things about London Zoo was that a writer named A.A. A. Milne anyone, uh, used a bear here as his inspiration for a particular book called Winnie the Pooh. So Winnie the Pooh was based on an actual animal from our friends at the London Zoo. Another iconic image is this image right here of Big Ben and Houses of Parliament. And there are a few more images more iconic. So when you show this picture, most people can identify it as Big Ben. It rises right up next to Houses of Parliament. But the thing is, Big Ben is actually the big bell of the striking clock. So it's not even actually the clock or the tower. So that's important to know. The building is actually called 
Elizabeth Tower. And you can actually visit it. The Houses of Parliament, you can actually visit uh, on the Houses of Parliament on certain days and listen in to arguments, which, you know, in a very British way is, is quite fascinating. Obviously, another iconic image is our, the London cabs. Um, those black cabs are ubiqu ubiquitous in London. You'd see them everywhere. They are the lifeblood of getting around London if you're not riding the tube. And interestingly, it is not so easy to be a London, a London cabbie. It is not simple. It takes between two to four years to, be, to learn the ins and outs of being a cabbie. You have to know every single street. And that's impressive when you consider the size and breadth of London, of London, London City. I couldn't do it. Another image, another place, we're well not image so, so, so much, is a place you wanna see is Trafalgar Square. It's a great focal point. Um, obviously has the statue of Trafalgar, there's Trafalgar right up there, Ooh. And one of the places that you, you know, there's lots of things to do in and around Trafalgar Square. Um, there's tremendous shops and, uh, Rest, there's restaurants and just a lot of activities. And up until fairly recently, there was also a lot of pigeons. So they had quite a pigeon problem as you can see in that left picture. And uh, the town fathers decided and mothers decided that they needed to do something about it. So they incited a rule where as of 2003, you can't feed the pigeons anymore. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen uh, Mary Poppins and there's a scene wh where the woman has the pigeons around her. You don't see that so much anymore. They don't really encourage that, unfortunately, but it makes for a very easy walking experience, which is, which is kind of nice. So the Tower of London, now this is a place you have to visit. It's definitely, a, if you've never been, it's 100% one of the top things you need to do. Now it's over 900 years old. So it's seen a tremendous amount of history. It's, it's had seen life as a prison holding uh, Anne Boleyn. That's a famous one. And then also Guy Fawkes. A lot of people don't know who Guy Fawkes was, but on the 5th of November, he tried to bomb parliament. He was unsuccessful and he was put into the Tower of London for his crimes, understandably. It's also been home to menagerie as well as, um, as a royal mint and has hosted, even hosted royals in terms of staying there, not as a prison, but actually living there, which is, which is nice. And it currently houses the crown jewels. So you can actually take a tour through and they will show you all the, all the antiquity, all the sites and everything. And then they'll take you finally to the crown jewels so you can see it in all its splendor. On the right, those are the beef eaters. Those are the yeoman warders as they're officially really called. And in order to become one, it's not so simple. You must spend 22 years in the military. And you also have to agree with your family to live on the grounds. So I've heard that the Tower of London could be haunted. So if you like the idea of living in a haunted house, that could be a nice place uh, for you to get, get a job at. Um, they handle a nightly ceremony called the Ceremony of the Keys, which where they go and lock the gates at precisely 9.53 p.m. every night. The bee feeders are a great resource also when you're at the tower of the history of the place. They have great stories of people who've been there, um, not just recently, like, but back in the day, they know so much history of it. They can even tell you about the crows that live in the Tower of London as well. Okay, so you, this picture obviously shows some more images of the Houses of Parliament and Big Ben. And you can also see one of those wonderful red double-decker buses, which are wonderful. And in the left-hand corner, you see something called the eye. So it is not really a merry-go-round, although you might think of it as one, but basically you hop into a clear pod and you circle through for about 30 minutes. And during that time, you get different vantage points of London city. So it's a great spot to really get a sense of the lay of the land. People use it oftentimes to get married. There've been wedding ceremonies there. Uh, I believe that you can actually reserve to have dinner there if you so chose um, and just cycle through. <laughs> I, I might get seasick. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I could do it. If you can't do that, then you might want to try a tea ceremony. 
um, the afternoon tea or high tea as it's often called. Sometimes someone will say to you, do you want a cuppa? And they're asking if you want a cup of tea, you will get some at an afternoon tea. Uh, it usually takes place in mid afternoon and they bring out, as you'll see in this picture, a multi-layered tray covered with all sorts of sweets, but also sandwiches as well. Cucumber sandwiches are, are very popular, but there's, they mix in a lot of different things. Salmon, very, very mixed, big mixed bag. But one thing they always bring out too is the clotted cream, which you put on those wonderful scones that come out warm. You put on the strawberry jam, I'm getting hungry. So, and there's different kinds of tea. So, in not just the tea to drink, but different types of tea, of tea, afternoon teas that you can do. There are some that have a funky flavor where it's uh, the Mad Hatter, where it's a Mar Alice in Wonderland theme. You could have one that has a, more of an Asian theme where they might bring you out some dim sum. So, and so there actually is a really amazing one that I want to try to do. It's at the Shard, which is that really massive uh, hotel and business center uh, right on the banks of the Thames. And you can actually do a high, do a tea, high tea, I think on the 70th floor or something like that. So lots of options to get your, your tea on in London. London Tower, London Bridge here, or Tower Bridge as it's called, is in the, that lower right picture. And one of the things you can do there, which is a recent addition, is you can actually go up there and they actually have installed glass floors so that you can actually see below you into the Thames. So if heights aren't an issue, that might be something that you might want to experience. Oops. Obviously you can't talk about England without mentioning some of the literary and film history and, and TV history as well. Um, I mean, I, you can go back old school for TV and look at Monty Python and you can go new school film and talk about Harry Potter. So obviously Harry Potter was this massive phenomenon. Very few people haven't heard of Harry Potter or of platform nine and three quarters, which you can technically visit uh, at King's Cross Station. I think they put up, a, take advantage of the, of the attention. They did put up a little area where you could pretend to be at Hogwarts uh, for, on your way to Hogwarts, I should say. If you really want to experience Harry Potter in depth, you can actually do a tour outside of London where you can go to an actual studio and they have tons of props there um, and tons of sets and all of that. Um, it's not that far to London. Most people do it as like a package tour. They bust you out. One of my, a friend of a friend did it uh, a couple of years back. And when he was there, um, if you don't know who Harry Potter, all the Harry Potter stuff, you don't, might not know who Matthew Lewis is. Matthew Lewis played the character of Neville Longbottom who actually slayed the Horcrux, but that's another story. But so it's, they always bring out surprising guests and it's just a neat experience from people who've done it have told me that it's just amazing and they would totally do it again. Um, if movies are more your thing, there's, a, oh, sorry, I shouldn't, I, I, I skipped over Sherlock and I apologize. I got excited because I was gonna talk about James Bond, but Sherlock Holmes uh, was actually, as you know, written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So he's actually Scottish, he was born in Edinburgh. So while you can't exactly go to Baker Street and tour Sherlock Holmes house, because that doesn't really exist, but you can go to this little area and take a little picture at that address if you so chose. So a lot of people will do that. Um, all right, so, and also Charles Dickens. Uh, can't, can't skip Charles because Charles Dickens actually spent a lot of time in London and he had a house there and I toured it many years ago at Christmas time and they did it up uh, all in the Victorian style, which was, which was pretty great, which was pretty amazing. So again, movies, I started to touch on that when I brought up James. Um, so James Bond, obviously, since it's you know totally English, Obviously tons of filming sites throughout London, into Scotland. Like if you wanna see where Skyfall was filmed, you have to go to the Windy Roads of Glencoe. Um, obviously Harry Potter to all over England. Um, Durham Cathedral is a great spot to visit. It's, it is a bit of a drive from London, it's over two hours, but it's where McGonagall taught the young wizards as you can see. Um, if Jane Austen is your thing, which it kind of is for me, uh, Brighton, England, um, they use that as one of the sites for during the film Emma, as well as Salisbury, as you can see. So obviously a lot of sites and this little map kind of highlights where those sites, particular sites were, if you wanted to check them out. Obviously music, 
how can we not talk about England and music? Um, everybody knows who the Beatles are, but does anybody know who Henry Purcell is or Edward Elgar is? I'm sure their hands going on, but yeah, I know what he is. Those are all composers from way back when. So far more recently, um, we have Liverpool's Beatles, uh, Manchester's Oasis, if you're familiar with the band Oasis or the Smiths, perhaps. Uh, you also have London, London's Queen. We use them, you know, obviously Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody came out several years ago and I love that movie. It's just a great, it also gives you a sense of some, uh, the, the, the culture of the time as well. Then you also have Scotland's uh, Annie Lennox, who is in the Eurythmics. Uh, you also have the Proclaimers. Everybody knows that song, 500 Miles, um, as well as the Bay City Rulers, if you're into that, <laughs> if you're into the 60s music, oh my goodness. Um, and then no matter where you are, there's a lot of music, live music as well. So you, there's tons of, of cool little places to see music in, in throughout England. And they really enjoy pulling out their music and just playing it in their little, in the pubs everywhere. And there's also street performers that are called buskers and they might be on the street with their, their guitar case opened up. And if they're playing a little tune, you might want to throw them um, like, a, like a, a pound or two if you so chose, which, you know, which would be a nice thing, but a lot of music in England. Television. For the small screen, we have to talk about Bridgerton. Um, they obviously started the second season. I'll be honest, I haven't started the second season yet, so I, I know I'm a little behind, but I remember the first season was really lovely. I mean, just all the costumes and the scenes that they used in the Bath area, Hampton Court, both places you can visit. So Bath is definitely a, a must-see, uh, and also Hampton Castle can easily be toured from London as well. Uh, Downton Abbey recently had their movie come out and they obviously use quite a few places uh, throughout England for their scenes, particularly in Berkshire, England, which is where High Clare is. And that's worth a visit. You can actually tour it, uh, the High Clare. And the thing is, as it says here, it is only open 60 to 70 days a year. So you do have to plan very carefully to make sure that you can get in and see it. Scotland has been front and center recently. Uh, because of the recent, the new series, not the new series, the next set series of episodes of Outlander. So uh, for those of you who want to you know, experience that, there's Glencoe, Fife, all these areas. Blackness is where they used uh, for Fort Williams headquarters. And Outlander uh, is just a wonderful series. I mean, yes, it goes back and forth between times, but it shows a lot of the, the areas magnificent areas of Scotland, which are well worth it. Now, one of the things you, you can also visit is those familiar with the series will know that Claire crosses over at a, a ring of rocks called the uh, Cray Nadoon. And you can actually visit the site. It doesn't look quite like it is uh, on the movie series. So if you do go to see it, take it with a grain of salt, um, and, but you get the idea, um, but it's still well worth a, a trip to visit. So obviously more literary and film connections. I touched on Jane already, but that picture there on the bottom left is the, what they call the Royals Crescent. And it's got 30 terraced homes. Obviously you can't visit them, but they're terraced homes. You can stroll the path. You can almost feel the history, feel the stories. Um, next is Hugh Grant. And I put Hugh Grant because I said, well, everybody probably knows who Hugh Grant is in the movie he was in called Notting Hill with Julia Roberts. And this is a good picture of what a market day might look like. You can see how colorful the homes are. And that's one of the, one of the big reasons people love Notting Hill is because they've taken it to heart and colored their houses in such pretty ways. Um, you can visit Portobello Market on the weekends. It's best to get there pretty early though. So you can beat the crowds because it does get pretty crazy there. Uh, as far as Scotland goes, we can represent with Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote Treasure Island, as you know. Um, so obviously our Scottish friend. And then there's that Shakespeare guy. So it's a fairly easy trip to Stratford-upon-Avon if you want to see Anne Hathaway's cottage. Um, you can also, in London, visit the Redone Globe Theater. Um, it burned down uh, many years ago, back in the 1600s, but they rebuilt it, and it's been up and running for a long time, staging plays, basically as we speak. I think they're actually showing Much Ado About Nothing right now, so totally worth it. And you might be lucky enough to see some big names uh, in performance there, because they do go on stage there quite often. Oops, sorry. 
quickie. So a bit, oops, I just skipped, sorry. A bit further afield, we have the Cotswolds and, and the Lake District. And I love to represent these two areas because they are really so gorgeous. Uh, it's a great place for strolling and, and hiking. And just the, the towns are just so picture perfect and lovely. And they've really done a wonderful job to preserve the, this, these areas for future generations and not let them fall into disrepair. So when you tour these, these, these towns, like Castle Coombe, for example, that picture there was actually taken by my coworker Anne on uh, her visit recently. Um, I've actually been to Castle Coombe as well and just fell in love with the whole area. It was just, just gorgeous. Byberry right there is considered another one of the most perfect representations of the Cotswolds feel. So it's definitely worth a stroll because it is so, so beautifully and so well preserved. On a slightly sillier note, um, got to make it silly just for a minute. Uh, the town of Blake's Blockworth actually hosts something called the cheese rolling. And they take, literally take a ginormous roll of Gloucester cheese and roll it down this very steep hill. And basically the idea is you run down that hill and if you can make it to the bottom, you can have the cheese. So I love cheese, but I would not be one of those people that would do it because there's a lot of injuries with that. But so I don't know how that all started, to be honest, but I would like to see it once, but I don't think I would participate for sure. Coth Lake District is another area that is very close um, as you travel north and you can stop in this area and hike. There's a tremendous amount of hiking here. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Pride and Prejudice, the one that starred Kira Knightley fairly recently, there's a scene where she's standing on some rocks and her, and her dress is flowing behind her. Um, you probably have that DV DVD at the library. You should definitely watch it because there's a scene where it's her dress is flowing. That was actually taken in the Lake District. All right, so they used a lot of images from that movie in the Lake District area. And as you can see for those two pictures there, how could you not want to visit someplace so incredibly gorgeous? Next stop as we head north is York. And the reason I pull this up is one, a little silly, but not so silly. And is, you know, what's the big deal? Why did I bring it up? So on the left is an ad for a company called Roundtree, as you can see. They were a candy company that started in the mid 1800s and their first big thing was these gums and they were flavored gums and they were fruit flavored. So they were called, eventually became known, the Brits call them fruit gums and kind of like a Haribo bear or even a Sour Patch Kid kind of thing. And big, big deal, big deal in that area, big supporter of the of that countryside. So everybody knows who Roundtree is. To me, the biggest reason we should know about them is that they invented the Kit Kat. So I love them for that. So I'm grateful for Roundtree very much. <laughs> On the right-hand side, more historical side, is what they call the shambles. And it's an old street where with overhanging, as you can see, overhanging timber frame buildings, some are as old as from the 14th century. And they usually housed a lot of like butcher shops and things like that. And obviously space was at a premium, so they had to maximize the best they could. And now it's a really wonderful shopping destination. And as you can see here, people are strolling and also the cobblestone streets. And it's just a really pretty spot and very interesting spot. And it is believed that it was the inspiration for Diagon Alley from the Harry Potter series. I think when we look at this picture, we can definitely feel that. I think I do feel that for sure. Yep. So here are two gentlemen that you might recognize. If anyone watches Outlander, you might know that a man on the left is Sam Ewan. And then the gentleman on the right is Craig McTavish both players in the Outlander series. Obviously, Sam played Jamie Frazier, who's one of the leads. Uh, I wanted to show this picture because for two reasons. One, they're actually sporting somewhat traditional. I mean, the tops are not so traditional as much, but the, you can see them, they have their sporins and their kilts on. So I thought that was really neat. They actually did a neat series on stars. If you can get access to stars, you might want to check it out. It's called Men in Kilts. 
and they do a wonderful series of going around Scotland and highlighting different things. And it's a wonderful love letter to the country. And it's very funny as well, because the two of them take, you know, take the piss out of each other quite a bit. So it's well worth it. So obviously we all know that Scotland and England have a pretty bloody history. Um, no more so than on the fields of Culloden in the 1700s when Bonnie Prince Charlie's Jacobite army faced off against the English and failed miserably. Uh, unfortunately, the Jacobites were um, exhausted. They didn't have a lot of food, so they were underfed, and it was just a total debacle. Approx over 1,200 soldiers died, and the English only lost about less than I think about 50 or 60. So it was a total tragedy on all sides, to be honest. It marked the end of the Stuarts' chances at the throne because Charlie went to France and was never heard from again, I guess. And, but it's definitely worth a visit. It's very somber, obviously, because of the history behind it, but it's included on most tours. So if you do a tour to Scotland, probably gonna be a stop in Culloden when the guide will talk to you about the actual battle and what went down. So it's, but even on a drive tour, it's, you've got to see it. It really is a super important spot. So anyone who knows me knows I'm a big fan of the movie, um, So I Married an Axe Murderer. Any of you who have seen it know it stars Mike Myers and he's Scottish. And one of his, one of his comments is that is Scottish food based on a dare because he's sent on an errand by his parents to get haggis. So haggis, as you can see here, includes some interesting things. Oatmeal I can get behind, onions, liver even, but sheep's lungs, the heart, I don't know. I don't know if I can do it. Um, I have tried it once and it wasn't terrible, but I will certainly not be raising my hand to, to eat it a tremendous amount. People often ask, is it an animal? The locals will actually say it's a wee beastie with four legs, two of which are shorter than the other. This means it can run around the highlands where it lives without falling over. You can catch it by running in the opposite direction. So obviously not a real animal, but they do sell little stuffed haggis but <laughs> with little ears and it's pretty funny. It is a very popular dish on January 25th, what happens to be the uh, Robert Burns day. He wrote it as an, he wrote an ode called Addressed to a Haggis. And I'm gonna read a little bit of it. Fair fi your honest sonsy face, great chieftain of the pudding race, abun them ya ayay, talk your place. So basically saying, you gotta get right up there with the chocolate puddings of the world, which I don't think is gonna happen. Still don't know if I'd ever eat it again. Edinburgh, now that we're in Scotland, obviously it's the capital as we all know. It's not the largest city though. That honor goes to Glasgow. Edinburgh was the first city in the world to have a fire brigade, which is impressive. It is also the greenest city in the UK with more trees per head than any other city. Interestingly, they also have the world's biggest electric blanket in the world. Not that the one you're gonna throw over your legs. It's actually 21 miles long and is under a stretch of road called the Mound. If it wasn't there, people would have a hard time with their cars getting up the hills. And yes, Edinburgh is built on a long extinct volcano. Now, who would have known that? I didn't know that. And you are welcome to climb up to it. Uh, apparently a big thing is to climb up there to see the sunrise, which I'm sure is pretty spectacular. Also in Edinburgh, you have uh, Holyrood House, which is at the end of the Royal Mile. So it's kind of hard to miss. So it's a place of residence for the queen. Obviously previous queens, you know, Mary Queen of Scots stay there and everything. You can actually do a, a tour of the grounds as well as a partial tour of the house itself, which is great because it gives you a lot of the history of the people who visited there. On a slightly different note, this is a statue of something of an image person, person, I'm gonna call him a person, of Greyfriars Bobby, Bobby. He was a sky terrier who became known in the 19th century Edinburgh for spending 14 years guarding the grave of his owner until he, he himself died on the 14th of January, 1872. And there are so, a lot of books and a lot of movies about him. And it's just a testament to devotion and uh, you'll notice too that his nose is a little shiny. That's because tourists, not locals, have taken to rubbing his, his nose for what they feel might be good luck. 
But unfortunately, the Edinburghans are not too thrilled with that because it does require upkeep. So there was a campaign recently that said hands off the bobby <laughs> so that people would stop rubbing his nose because when you rub his nose, you're taking some away some of the statues. So don't rub his nose when you go there. Another thing that we can't forget is whiskey. Scotland has some amazing whiskey. And you'll notice one, two, one important thing. Whiskey does not have an E in it. So if it's whiskey from Scotland, it's not gonna have the E. And in order to be Scotch whiskey, it has to mature in oak casks for at least three years. So if you're buying whiskey and it says it's Scotch whiskey and it's spelled with an E, it ain't the real deal. Scotland sends a tremendous amount of bottles uh, overseas, over 1 billion. I know my brother has bought several of those. Uh, <laughs> this space side is considered whiskey heaven. And I'm going to check the Glen Livet down towards the bottom that I think a lot of folks might know that name. That's a very big name in the uh, whiskey player arena. It's also in a very pretty area. So it's well worth checking out and doing a whiskey tour. And there's a lot of companies that will do that for you where you can do like whiskey tours, stop at different whiskey spots and just sample all the different options. It, and again, it is a usually popular thing to do. And in 2019, over 20 million people visited a distillery. So I highly encourage you to do so. I know I plan on doing it next time I'm in Scotland. So here's a couple beautiful images. Um, you know, we talked a lot about other things, but it's a wonderful country with lush fields, striking rocks and cliffs and sheep. And it has the tallest waterfall in Britain. Um, I'm gonna butcher this, but it's E-S-H-Y Aluin. And it's over 658 feet tall. So when it's in full flow, it's actually three times taller than Niagara. So that's pretty amazing. Scotland also has the oldest tree in Europe. It's a twisted yew that is over 3,000 years old. These two pictures here, I selected one that is a picture of Slane Castle, which is the one on the left, and that overlooks the North Sea. I believe you can go to it. I think it's a bit of a hike because it's quite far north. This destination on the right is easier to get to. That is actually uh, Loch Ness. And I tried to get a picture with Nessie and, and failed miserably. So this, again, this just emphasizes how gorgeous the countryside is, which makes it a really wonderful destination for just exploring and hiking. So, whoops. Picture worth is a thousand words, but now we're going to talk a little bit logistics, and this is where my, my friend Valerie is going to jump in. All right, so I guess we want to talk about actually getting to the UK and traveling there. So currently the UK has dropped all previous COVID restrictions for traveling. No more quarantine or testing or even vaccination requirements. Not even the passenger locator form is required. And soon we may not even need a mask to go over. British Air and Virgin Atlantic have already dropped their mask um, requirements on the flights. So everything we discussed here today can be visited either on a guided tour or on your own on a driving trip or a rail trip or a combination of all of those things. There's a great rail system that connects the major cities and even most of the smaller towns. Some folks prefer to base themselves in Edinburgh and then London and do day trips um, as there are an endless number of day tours out of London and out of Edinburgh. In all of the UK, they use British pounds, um, but beware if you've got some older paper 20 and 50 pound notes, they actually have um, retired those. And if you've got them, they need to be exchanged um, for the new plasticky polymer bills. And that can be done at any bank upon arrival. So they're not, you know, they're not useless, but your local merchants and restaurants will not take them. They will ask you to go exchange them at the bank. So current exchange rate is about 0.77 which means you'll need about $1.30 US to purchase one pound. And from my experience traveling there, 
all the prices that you see are very similar to what you'd see here for things, but you've just spent you know, 30 cents more to get your pounds. So everything is kind of 30% higher there than it is here. For electrical, you will need an adapter and a converter to convert their 230 volt electric currency to our US 110, 120. Um, you'll see the picture of their little plug there in the middle. Um, some folks don't know this, but just about all the newer electronic devices like cell phones and computers use universal electric current that works worldwide. So you don't need a converter, only the adapter to be able to plug in. Within London, they have got an extensive subway system that they call the underground or the tube for short. You can purchase either single or return tickets. That's another English to, or American to English difference. We say round trip, they say return. Um, you can purchase um, multi-day passes called an Oyster card and it'll give you free reign all over, all over London. And just like we have our major holiday weekends like Memorial Day and Labor Day, so does Great Britain. They call them bank holidays and they fall around the same time as ours, our major holidays. Their spring bank holiday, bank holiday is around our Memorial Day and their August bank holiday is the last weekend in August. Um, they're also a little more generous with their days off than we are. They get two days off for Christmas and three for Easter with Boxing Day, the day after Christmas and Good Friday and Easter Monday around Easter time. Um, so if you're traveling around then, be sure to check their calendar because most things are closed um, during those times. So a great place to eat and drink are the pubs. Um, you can find one on just about every corner in both the big cities and the small towns. Typically, you'll find them very casual, offering inexpensive, simple lunch or dinner, soups, prawn cocktail, fish and chips, shepherd's pie, or a plowman's lunch, which is basically just hunks of crusty bread, ham and cheddar. Um, and of course you can get your pint of beer or half pint if you don't want that much. Um, but pubs aren't the only place to eat. The culinary scene um, in Britain has really flourished in recent years and they have really moved far beyond their old reputation of having you know, terrible food and with so many immigrants in living in the UK, um, curry is quite common. And in the larger cities, you can get food from just about any region of the world, just like you can in the cities here. You will not go hungry. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, really enjoyed sharing our love of this destination. You can tell from both the way Valerie talks and the way I talk about it, how much we like this destination and how much we love sharing that with everyone. Because it, it is a great place to go. The people are, uh, you know, they're English, but they're so lovely. And uh, if you can understand the action in Scotland, they're great too. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thanks. Um, do you, does anyone have any questions? We do have a couple questions in the chat. And let's see. Most recent is what is the significance of the time at 9.53 when they say lock the gate? That's like Tower of London. That is, a, that is an excellent question. I, I'll be honest, I don't know what the significance is. Um, Valerie, do you have any insight? I didn't even know they did that. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to go to our dear friend Google and find out. <laughs> okay, all right. We can try to get you more information on that. Does anybody else have any questions they want to put in the chat? Oh, I like the chime on the clock. All right, well, oh, I'm ready. Thank the ladies tonight from French's Worldwide Travel. Of course, you can find um, 
books and movies of everything they were talking about tonight in the library, as well as different travel materials. And I know uh, the ladies will also take any questions that you might have. Um, you can reach them at French's Worldwide Travel, or you can um, bring a question over to us at the library and I'm sure we can get the answers for you. Um, stay tuned for an upcoming uh, program this summer, possibly on oceans of possibilities, which will be our summer reading theme. And if anybody has any last words, we'll stay on another couple of seconds and then just thank you everyone for coming. So we have there was another question I see in the chat. I yeah. will answer that one. So, Interestingly, I actually was thought about putting this into the presentation because there is a lot of confusion over what's the UK, what's Great Britain, what's the British Isles. So the British Isles is a geographic term referring to the islands that encompass um, England, Scotland, and Wales, as well as Ireland and Northern Ireland. So it's a geographic term. Whereas Great Britain is just that island to the right that has England, Scotland, and Wales. And the United Kingdom is the political term for the government that consists of England, Scotland, and Wales, and Northern Ireland. So the four countries are the United Kingdom specifically as a political name for them. So that's the main distinction there. Okay, thank you very much. Does anybody else have any questions? And actually, if anybody did want to take their selves off mute and ask a question, I think that would be okay now too. Absolutely. Going once. <laughs> Sold. Going Sold to the woman in the into the iron mask. Yes. All right. Well, thank yeah. you both. And thanks yeah. for thank having you for us. Listening, it everybody. Was fun. It was fun putting it all together and going through all our pictures and remembering all our fun trips there. Well, you definitely yeah. both know your stuff. That's for sure. So thank you. It was just wonderful. So thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks Have everybody. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Thanks, Michelle.